So this is my guide for beginners. I just wanted to put an intro into this video. It's recorded after the fact, so it might not run perfectly with the next section. To say use this as a guide to drop in and out of when you get to certain parts of the game. It's very, very long, and if someone's picking up the game for the first time, I'll, there's no point watching it all the way through because most of it you're gonna miss. Um, so there'll be a content section at the beginning which shows what section, covers what area and there'll be timestamps within that um, so you can look at what area you want to look at. Hope you enjoy the content, consume it as you need it um, and uh, yeah, please enjoy. Hey all, uh, firstly let me introduce myself. My name's Adam and I've created this channel Fuzzy Ducks Gaming to help people new and old in D&D Neverwinter. So all my videos so far have been aimed at experienced Neverwinter players um, looking at getting into mod 16 and how to improve. However, I thought it'd be a good idea to bring out a guide for brand new players as there hasn't been any similar content recently and with all the changes that have been made, I can imagine this is quite a difficult game to get into now as a beginner. So all I'm going to assume at this stage is that you've downloaded and installed Neverwinter and you're ready to jump straight in. Um, so we'll be playing and going along as this video progresses so you will hear me clicking controllers and stuff like that. Um, so if we go down to new character The first thing that we need to do is pick a class and a race we're making a character. So I'll very quickly go through the races and styles so you can be confident that you're picking one that suits you. Um, so if we start with a race, at this stage I'll just ignore races, just pick the one that you think uh, looks like a character you want to play with because you're going to be looking at the character a lot. If you pick one that's ugly and you don't like the look of it, it's going to annoy you after a while. So let's just randomly pick the Sun Elf. So, in terms of classes, we'll go through and I'll explain what they are and what sort of style they are. So what we'll do is go down to the bottom and we will start with the Fighter and the Barbarian. Now these two now are quite similar. They're melee characters, they swing a big sword, they can both play a tank or a DPS role. Uh, the Fighter will carry a shield and a one-handed sword and the Barbarian just a big two-handed sword. So if you like the sound of that style of play, then these classes may be for you. So Paladin is the only class in the game that can play healer or tank and they work really well as both. They have great utility and a really highly desirable at end game. I would say for a beginner on your first character, probably steer clear of it because they can be difficult to level because you don't have a straight DPS path. This is one personally I looked at more to build as a second character once I had more knowledge of the game and it did work out quite well. Um, so next we're going to go up to the Rogue. Now this is your typical stealth ninja type character. They're really fun to play and they use a lot of stealth and melee attacks and basically use double blades. We'll then look at the ranger. So the ranger is the only class in the game where you basically get two sets of encounters depending on what weapon you're using. So as you can see from the screen, they've got a bow and arrow selected. You get three encounters for that. Later on in the game, you unlock an additional bar where you can switch to swords and then you get another three encounters. Um, they are really versatile, you can play purely range, you can play purely melee, or you can do a mixture of both. So moving to the Warlock, um, this is a class that can play healer and DPS. They basically use dark magic and fire along with some heals over time. At this point in time, I'll be honest, they're not in the best place, but things move quite quickly and things change. Um, so the DPS path is perfectly viable, so if a Warlock sounds like it suits you, then I wouldn't hesitate. If you're more a person that thinks I want to play a healer, to be honest, I'll avoid the Warlock. At the moment, they have the lowest potency heals, they take quite a lot of game knowledge to get to work and high item levels to work well. So while we're on the subject of healers, Cleric is by far and away the most popular healer in the game. They're really beginner friendly and they put out the biggest heals. If you want to play a healer, then this is the best place to start. Also, helpfully, they have a DPS path, which makes leveling really easy. If you wanted to just purely play DPS, I would avoid a cleric as your first character because they're difficult to use, they take a little bit of game knowledge, and they're certainly easier classes to start. So then we'll move on to the last class, which would be the wizard. So the wizard is a ranged magic class, specializes in cold, fire, and arcane spells. Um, they're great fun to use, they've got a good mix of area and effect and single target spells. They're not the easiest class to level at the beginning, as I find that a lot of the good powers come later on in the leveling path, but they are really, really good end-game DPS classes, 
and I would say at the moment they're easily the most potent magic based class so don't let the difficult leveling experience put you off this class. So we've gone through classes and then we've gone through uh, what role you want to play and what type of character you want to be. The last thing to look at as we go through is ability scores. Now these are fixed depending on the class that you are but depending on the race that you choose you can get some small bonuses. Um, so I've picked a wizard um, and for wizard we really want to be working on intelligence because that adds to magic damage. But all you really need to remember is strength is physical damage and intelligence is magic damage. The rest as you'll go through the game and learn more you can pick and choose um, how you want to improve your character. But for now I wouldn't worry about it. So I'm going to pick my character, I'm not going to bother changing it. And then I'll pick a name. And then you're good to begin your adventure. Um, so that's the first part of the video over and I'll be right back once my character has progressed a little bit. So I've magically changed class from a wizard to a barbarian. Um, I've got lots of characters at different uh, kind of points in the game and it helps when making these sort of videos. Um, so what we're going to move on to next is the character stats. So you notice when you load in, you go into your menu, character sheet, you're, you're, you're given quite a lot of stats to look at. And as a new character, this can be really overwhelming. I would totally ignore anything past the ratings at this point. Uh, so really, the best way to explain it is each stat in your character, um, other than power, will have a counter stat. So power is basically, as it says here, increases your damage and healing. So uh, the higher your power, the more damage you deal and the more healing you do. Uh, the ratio is 1,000 to 1%, but the higher your power gets, um, you start to see slightly diminishing returns because of the way the formula works. Don't worry about that. Basically, more power is more damage or more healing. So then we move on to armor penetration and defense, and these basically counter each other. So defense... Uh, blocks armor penetration. So if an enemy has a thousand defense, you need a thousand armor penetration to do maximum damage. And then we move down to crit strike and crit avoidance. Similar again, you need higher than your enemy's crit avoidance to start having a critical chance. So basically, when you get to end game, 1000 critical strike is 1% critical chance. So let's say, for an example, an enemy has 10,000 crit avoidance, then you will need 50,000 above that to get the maximum 50% chance you can get in the game. Accuracy and deflect, again, uh, if a deflect is higher than accuracy, it means that some of your attacks on an enemy will get deflected, um, which is normally 50% of the damage is lost. So there is no, you have to get a certain amount above it. As long as your accuracy is above the enemy's deflection, then they won't be able to deflect any of your attacks. And then the last one is combat advantage and awareness. So combat advantage, just to quickly explain, you can't get on your own. You need either another person or a companion to work with to get combat advantage in most cases. Um, so combat advantage is basically if I was to attack this private Branley here and there was someone standing here, I would have combat advantage because we're basically flanking the enemy. So what the stats do is however high above the other, like the enemy's awareness, your combat advantage is, you'll do 1% additional damage for each 1,000. So in this case, let's say the enemy had my awareness, which is just over a 1,000, and I was attacking them with my combat advantage. If I get combat advantage, I'll get 10% extra damage. Um, and you'll know when you've got combat advantage uh, because you'll see there'll be a line in front of an enemy and it will change color. So we'll, we'll quickly go and engage. So you can see there's a white line at the back of the enemy if I had combat advantage, it goes purple. Now, it looks like the companion I'm using randomly gives me combat advantage because that circle went purple. Uh, someone just ran in and totally ruined my demo. But you'll see it. If it's white, you don't have combat advantage. If there's a purple line, you need to stand in front of that to get combat advantage. But I would say the best, best way to learn is just start playing and you'll pick these up as you go along. So the best way to play and learn the game is really just to play the campaign in order. Um, so the way the game works is you'll do campaigns and as you level up more and more open up if you get to within two levels of a campaign zone then Sergeant Knox in Protector's Enclave should have the starting quest for you for a zone there is no rule you do not have to complete any campaign zones in order to open the next one up you don't have to complete any particular ones to finish the game 
It basically does it on a level requirement. As you hit the level requirement, that campaign zone will open up once you get in two levels of it. The only thing I would say is, do not skip Never Death Graveyard or Black Lake District because you get bags as rewards and trust me, you're gonna need them. You start off with a very small bag, you get one extra one and you will get a lot of stuff dropping as you go through the game. Um, so bags are a really, really important item, so don't skip those two areas. Other thing I would say is do not worry about stats or gear as you level up, just put on whatever drops. The only thing you might want to look to upgrade if you get maybe 10 levels above it is your weapon, because every bit of damage you do or every bit of healing you do is based off your base weapon damage. Um, but we'll get into like trading and stuff later on. You could buy one for next to nothing from the auction house. If you if you really found you were struggling, um, then you, you would be able to buy a weapon to keep you going. And basically keep doing this until you hit 70. You don't need to change gear, you don't need to look at your stats. As long as you're completing the content and you're not getting stuck for ages in one part, just follow until you hit level 70 and then there'll be a section later on in the video that covers that off. So I'm not going to make this, this video um, too mammoth, but it is going to be quite a lot of content. But I'll try and just cover off what's important. So if we start with the three major things that add to your stats other than your gear, and these are enchantments, companions, and mounts. So enchantments, they're very, they're very in type, um, but they're basically stones that you can slot into your gear, and they give boost to your stats. Do not worry about these at all until you hit 70. If you get some enchantments that are level 7 or lower, by all means slot them into gear that you have. I wouldn't spend gold removing them. If you then upgrade your gear, I would just ditch the gear and the enchantments because they're not worth the gold to pull out of the items. Um, we'll come on to enchantments and companions and mounts in more detail. This is really just a summary. Um, so we'll move on to companions. And these are basically, as you can see here, they are an ally that you can summon. And you get two types. You get an augment or you get like a standard companion that will have a different category. It could be fighter, um, it could be defender. They do, they're meant to do different things, but really they do very little. Um, so really there's an augment and a standard. A standard companion can fight with you and can help you out. An augment just basically transfers stats to you, but doesn't get involved in any of the combat. As I say, we'll get to this in more detail later, um, but these are really important. So don't overlook your companion and the items that you can put on them. But as I say, we'll, we'll come to this later. Um, and then the third would be mounts. Now you get access to mounts fairly early on and you will get a quest to go and get a standard mount, which will be one of these. They have a movement speed of 30, I think, no, 50. Um, oh, that might even be lower than that. Uh, maybe it's default, but yeah, you get a, a small boost to movement speed when you're on your mount. Um, mounts are really important because they do get you around campaign zones quicker. So if we look at me running, not particularly quick. Now I do have an epic mount that are a little bit quicker, um, but as you can see, there's quite a lot of difference between that and then just that. So mounts really early on are just used to get you around zones quicker. I would recommend if you can get a rare one for cheap, do it because it will speed up your leveling, but they're not, they're not needed and you don't really need to look at mounts in detail until much later in the game. So now I'm going to get into the aspect of currency. Now this confuses a lot of people when they start, certainly confused me. Uh, but the best way to look at it in terms of currency is you get three main forms of currency in Neverwinter. You get gold, you get AD or astral diamonds, and you get zen. So gold is basically mainly used for trading between NPCs. You also need gold to remove... Um, items from your gear. This character is very low so he doesn't have any gear where you can slot enchantments but you will get on this armor for example you might get I'm just going to see if I've got so here for example these boots have a utility slot for an enchantment where if I wanted to I could slot an enchantment into that to give me a boost to some stats. If I do that I've then got to pay gold to get it out and that's to be honest Mainly it's used for that and there are some professions later on which I'm not going to even get into because you don't need to touch it in the game. But that, that would generally be what gold is used for. The currency you're going to see the most of and use the most of is going to be astral diamonds. And this is basically the in-game currency that you can earn. Uh, and this is used to buy items off the auction house and there's a couple of other NPC traders that you can buy stuff off of. Um, so if we were to just quickly go to 
the trade house and I'll just search for you don't need to know what I'm searching for at the moment because it, it might not mean anything doesn't matter but we'll search for a level 7 enchanting stone and we can see that there's one for 150 astral diamonds so I've got 937 so I can say yep I want to buy that and then what you need to do once you've done that is you need to go to a uh, mailbox and collect that item so I'll move over here somewhere. I don't know why my player just charged halfway down the map just because I was in a menu. So I have VIP because I've played this game for a long time. So I can summon a mailbox whenever I want. If you don't have VIP, you'll need to go to somewhere like Protector's Enclave. There's, there's mailboxes scattered around um, the map. So then I've got my enchantment. So if I wanted to slot it into here, I can do and then I have to pay gold to remove it so this is just 10 bronze to remove it so it's not too much um, but it gets more and more expensive depending on the item um, so astral diamonds as I say are going to be your main form of currency the best way to earn this when you're first starting out is after a few levels I think it might be level 12 once you hit level 12 if you go to queues you get access access to what's called a random leveling queue you get a bonus the first time you complete this every day and I would 100% recommend that you do it and you'll, you'll see why later because we need 40 to 50,000 Astro Diamonds to basically make our leveling and progression into endgame really, really smooth. So you'd basically just click A on that queue, press X to join and it will join you up with four other players. Um, if you get other players all at a low level, they can be a bit difficult but you'll get through them. And if you can't, and you fail, just re and do it again. You want to get those Astral Diamonds every day. Um, so the other thing I'll quickly go across is not relating to currency, but once you get to a certain point in the game, you'll be able to pray at certain times. You have to do it from these campfires if you don't have a certain level of VIP. And each time you do this, you will get what's called a rough Astral Diamonds boost. So the currency that you get from your queue is going to be rough and it needs refining until you can spend it. You can refine 100,000 a day, you'll get nowhere near that limit uh, for a long, long time. So don't worry about that. Uh, and then that boost actually gives you 50% extra. So if I had a boost of 2,000 Astral Diamonds and I had 1,000 to refine, when I refine that, it gives me 1,500. That's important as well because it all adds on to that currency that you can get. Um, then the last form of currency is called Zen. Zen, the only way to get it, there's two ways to get it. The first is buy it with money which is it's not the worst thing in the world if you just want to get started and you're like, well, I would spend £4 on a burger, so actually I like this game. I'm going to buy 5,000 Zen and I'm either going to spend it in the store or what I would recommend if you do buy Zen early doors is you can exchange it with other players for Astral Diamonds at a rate at the moment of 506 Astral Diamonds per one Zen. So if I had bought 500 then I can actually get 250,000 Astro Diamonds for that amount, um, which is a really, really, really good amount early on. And it would help a lot, but it's not necessary by any means. This game is 100% possible to play for free and to get to end game for free with the changes that have been introduced. Um, so that covers the currency off. So I'll move over to the next part of the guide, which is going to be guilds and alliances. This works similar to every other type of MMO and lots of the, the games that you might play on your phone. A guild is a collection of people that play together. You don't even have to play together, but they, they operate together. You have a shared chat function. You get things like guild banks and stuff like that. And this character isn't in one. Probably not the best one to pick for an example. Um, so I'll be back with a character that's actually in a guild, and then we'll go from there. So while we wait for this character to load in, um, I'll just, as I said, start talking about guilds and alliances. Um, but in basic terms, a guild is a group of people, an alliance is groups of guilds. Um, as you can see, I've loaded in to what's called a stronghold, which is like the, the, your guild area. And you'll see at the bottom that you have alliance chat and guild chat. So they're channels that you can use when you need help or you want to play with other people. Um, so alliance would literally send that message to everyone in your alliance, and guild would just do it to the people within your individual guild. So if we just go to my guild, you can see here that basically you're allowed 150 individual gamer tags. So that would be my your Xbox gamer tag, your account. Um, you're allowed 150, and then in terms of actual characters, because you can have more than one, you're allowed 500. 
And then if we go to alliances, these are all guilds that are affiliated with each other. So as you can see, when you've got all these, so we've got 13 guilds in an alliance. If you can get an active guild and an active alliance, you can have so many people that you can play with. Like we do clean out our players regularly. We get lots of new ones in. Um, but if someone's inactive for say three to four weeks, then they'll be removed. They can obviously come back in when they when they become active again, but it's just to make sure there's space. So as you can see, our alliance has 3,300 members. There is always someone available online to do something with. These are a major, major important part of the game. Not only because you get stuff like um, you get boons from them, you also get things called a guild bank. Um, where other players that are higher leveled may have gear that they're not interested in at all and it's only worth a few hundred AD, they don't want to go through the hassle of selling it, they may put that in a guild bank for newer players just to take for free. Um, and most good alliances and guilds will do this, so I'd certainly recommend you join one. Um, the other reason is purely for a social aspect. There's always stuff going on, a lot of guilds and alliances run competitions where you can win stuff, there are certain activities that you can only do in a guild, um, such as fighting dragons. And in general, if you join a good guild or a good alliance, there's always going to be someone to help with your character. Because um, there'll be times where you get stuck and you're not sure how to progress or how to better your build. If you're in a good guild and a good alliance, there'll be someone who can help you out and talk you through that. Um, so I'll just quickly run up to our guild bank just to see what's there. Run straight past it. And then this will give you an idea. So this guild I'm in, the only level requirement is that you hit max level, um, which is level 80, which if you start playing the game and you're keen on it, you'll do in, in well, depending on how much you play, you'd easily do it within a week. So if we go to my guild, for example, so we've got items, we've got enchantments, we have a couple of mounts, which you don't get these mounts, the green level mounts for free. You only get a gray one, so this would be quicker than your bog standard mount to other things like lock boxes, uh, artifacts which we'll come to. So there's there's loads of reasons to join a guild and I think if you don't join a guild it means an MMO is probably not for you because you'll just be playing solo and joining random people and when you want to do stuff. Um, so there's loads of information and videos about guilds and stuff so if you want to know more ask in the comments or, or look it up. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to switch characters again and we're now going to move on to companions in a bit more detail. As I said, companions are probably, I think, the most important part of the game in terms of the companions, the gear it gets, and what sort of affiliation it has with your character. So I'm going to see if I've got a low-level character in a guild. One of them, I have somewhere, and I can't find him. Come on. I know I've got a fairly low-level character in a guild somewhere, and I think it's him. We're going to go, so if he's not in a guild, it doesn't matter. Um, there was just a few things I wanted to show, but we can do later. So what I'm going to do is just run through companions, what they are, and what they do. Later in the video, again, there'll be a section at the end of the video where basically I give you the best advice I can to get kick-started in this game. Companions come into it. Um, so the way it works is you can have one summoned companion. As I mentioned in the brief intro... They can either be what's called an augment, who don't help you in fights, but they, they give you a bit more stats than normal companions, or it can be a companion that helps and, and can fight for you. Um, so if we look at my companion, at the moment I've got one, this is a panther. I don't have many on this character because it's one I don't use, but I've got the choice of three characters I can pick. I've got one at green, one at blue, and one at purple. So the higher the level, so it basically goes white, green, blue, purple, orange. So I'm going to pick this one at purple. And then the way they work is they have levels. So as you can see underneath his name, he's got rank 18, max 35. So 18 is the level that this companion's at. 35 is basically the max rank that an epic companion can hit. With each level a companion gets, he gets a few more stats. And then when you can get... If you get a legendary companion, which you can pretty much only get by paying to upgrade a purple one, which costs a million AD or some tokens that you can pick up. Don't worry about that for now. We'll just work with this purple companion that we've got. Uh, and as you can see on here, there are 
slots for what's called bonding runestones. Now these are the most important thing in the game because they give you a lot of stats. I'm briefly going to touch on it, but I will explain later on how best to utilise it. And then you'll see also that you can get companion gear, which you can slot, which also adds stats. Within that gear, you can slot runestones, which give you stats. So there's lots to go through. Um, when you get to, I don't know if it's 20, 25, 30, this other, oh no, 25. Um, so once a companion gets to rank 25, mine's currently 18, that will open up so I can put yet another piece of gear into him. Three and three is the max, regardless of what your companion is. It could be a max legendary companion. It's still only three bonding runestones and three companion items. You get companion experience by gaining experience, basically. So if I run around and do some quests and I get experience for those quests, then as I get experience, my companion gets that experience as well. You can also, you might pick up or you might come across these or you might buy them from the auction house. You can get companion experience treaties, which give your companion experience uh, so if you didn't want to wait a few days to level your companion up to get him experience, then you can use these. Depending what platform you're on, they vary in cost. On the Xbox, they're really cheap. They're about 1,500 AD each, but they're not needed because as you need to do the campaign anyway and you'll get loads of experience, your companion will get leveled up with you. And then what happens as you gain experience and you hit a new level then mine's grayed out because I don't have any extra levels, you'll get a training option. When you train your companion, a timer will come on and basically at the end of that timer, he'll be upgraded to whatever level his experience matches. And you can pay, so once you begin training, there'll be an option to pay Astral Diamonds to do it quickly. Up to you whether you want to do it, but during leveling, it's not necessary at all. So I'm gonna to touch on how companions are set up and what you want to aim for. I'm trying not to go too in depth because it can be really overwhelming for a new player. What I would recommend probably throughout this whole video is that you just go to the bits that interest you, consume that bit and then come back when you need to know a bit more about something else and consume that because if you just watch it all in a wanna, you're probably going to forget most of what I'm talking about. So we'll go into companions and we will look at runestones and equipment. So let's say runestones, I will quickly I will come onto this with another character and actually demo you know, what to do with them, that sort of thing. But if we go into the auction house and have a look for some bonding runestones, they're the only things you can slot in those three items. So if we look at rank nine, you can see that when you equip it, it grants you companion's gift. And this applies 40% of your companion stats to you. You can slot three of these, so if you had three at rank nine, you would get 120% of your companion stats. And that is all of their stats, including items that you can slot and runestones. So items, I've already bought a couple on this character. These cost me 700 AD each. So when I'm equipping these, they're giving me 3,000 armor pen and 2,000 critical strike on each of these. They're also giving what's called a combined rating of 420, which and that basically adds 420 to every stat. So if we slot two of them, that's 840 to everything, and then an extra 6,000 to armor pen and 4,000 to crit. So if we had those bonding stones, I'm going to get 120% of those stats, which is pretty huge. And as you get further on, you get higher level bondings that give you like 50, 55, 60%. You get higher items that give you more. And then the last thing that you can do to improve that even more is you can buy runestones. So if we look at this one, for example, um, a recondite runestone, if I slot this in an offensive slot in my companion's gear, I get 600 accuracy. If I put it in defense, I get 600 awareness. And again, I will get 120% of that because I've slotted those three runestones. And this is where you will get the majority of your stats in the game. If someone's got to end game, they've got good gear, and they look like their stats are nowhere near another character, there are some things it comes down to, but it's mainly going to be your bondings, your companion gear, and your runestones. They're the things 100% to concentrate on for the, you know, the, the fair, I'd say a month or two of the game when you start playing. So the last thing to look at in regards to companions is they all come with a bonus and they basically slot into different areas. 
So because my player, this is a Barbarian, can play a tank, he comes with three defence slots, an offence and a utility. You don't really need to worry about it at this stage, but, but basically every companion comes with a companion power. You slot that and those stats go directly to you. So I don't have any other companions that I could slot on this character, but this is what you would look at. And once you get to 80, you're comfortable with the game, you've got a bit of spare astral diamonds, that's when you start looking at filling these companion slots with what benefits you. And normally a DPS would go anything that gives power, and then a healer would go anything that gives outgoing healing. So the last thing to mention is each companion also comes with what's called an enhancement. And then these vary, but they basically just give you a few more stats. Um, when you fight an enemy, you have a chance when you hit them to proc a stat. So the one I've got on, for example, gives me a chance to get an increased 4% critical severity. Probably not a good one to choose because I haven't even introduced that stat. But crit severity basically increases the damage that your critical hits might do. So that was a lot to take in. I would maybe go back, rewatch a companion bit a few times until you understand it. Um, but we'll come back on to how to set it. I'll give you basically a cheats how-to guide to get started. So then now we've covered off companions. Then we'll move on to enchantments. So I mentioned enchantments earlier, which are these items. Was it even on this character? Yes, it was. So it's these items that you can slot into uh, the gear that you pick up. What you can also do is level these up. So it's called refining, and what you need is refinement points for that. Now refinement points come from mainly gems that you'll, you'll just automatically go in your inventory as you're going around killing things. You'll pick them up, you'll see them on the floor. You basically click on them and convert to refinement, and that's given me 40 refi refinement points. You can refine other items, but really, at this stage of the game, I'll probably just refine uh, your stones that you find on the floor. You can also refine gear, so once you've out-leveled your gear, you can convert to refinement points, but as you can see at low level, it's really not worth it, it's one refinement point. What you're better off doing with these items is selling them to a vendor for gold. So the way the leveling up works is you have to have, firstly, your refinement points. You'll then need what's called a reagent. And these you can either buy from the auction house, they drop in game, you can get them from vendors, depending on the level that you want to level up. So this, for example, is a rank 7 enchantment, and I want to take it to rank 8, and I need what's called a mark of potency, rank 4. Along with that, you can notice here that it says I only have a 40% chance of upgrading that item. What that means is, is if I go to upgrade it with that ward optional box greyed out, and it fails, I lose that reagent. Now, just for an example, these reagents, the mark of the rank four mark of potency, are about seventeen thousand astral diamonds. So, if I ro rolled that without a ward in, and it fails, I lose that, and I'm sixteen thousand astral diamonds out of pocket. So, the last item that you would use, which you can either get from the Zen store or from the auction house, they do drop in game, but fairly rarely, is a ward. So if we look at them in the Zen store, for example, in refinement, you will see that for 85 Zen, because there's a sale on at the moment, you can get 10 preservation wards. What preservation wards do is they will roll um, the chance at a 40%. If it fails, it doesn't take your reagent, it takes this one ward. So it's obviously a balancing act. Um, but normally it's always best to put a ward in because even if, if the thing completes, you don't use your ward. It uses a reagent, you get your ward back. Um, so these wards are there to stop you losing those reagents. I personally think it's all a bit of a swizz, but they make a lot of money out of it so I can understand why they do it. So I'm not going to level that up um, because a rank 7 enchant to rank 8 is not worth it because rank 8s are about 2,000 AD to buy and it's going to cost you about 20,000 to upgrade it. But that's the way you would upgrade your enchantments. I'm not going to go into that anymore. Just wanted to get you an idea of what you do to, to level them up. I'm not going to go into what the enchantments do. You will pick this up as you play the game. And I would literally ignore them until you get to level 70, 80 and need to start actually looking at your character. So my rule of thumb just in terms of leveling up enchantments 
It can vary on what they are, but normally if your enchantment is under a rank 11, it is not worth the money to upgrade. You're actually cheaper to just go on the auction house and buy it. There are some exceptions, like the, the ones that everyone wants. Maybe it's cheaper to upgrade them, but I would always check before you do that. So we've covered enchantments, we've covered companions, so I'm just going to very quickly cover mounts. Now there's not that much to go through because I think with mounts it can get very complex. So you want to really learn this as you go along, get in the guild and they'll be able to help you a bit more. But as a mount come with a equip power. So at this stage you have to have an epic mount or better to get an equip power. Because my character is low level I'm only getting a 500 bonus but when you get to the max level an epic mount will give you a 5000 stat boost and a legendary mount if you're ever lucky enough to get one will give you a 10,000 stat boost or, or or a different boost to different stats but for something like power or critical strike it's going to be five or 10,000 and then there's movement speed as well um, that varies and it gets quicker and quicker as the rarity uh, gets rarer on your mount and then combat power only comes with the legendary companion which I would not worry about at all they drop from lock boxes very, very rarely and cost millions and millions to buy. You shouldn't be buying a legendary mount until the rest of your character is finished, so I'm not even going to touch on them. Um, so the last thing to look at, which is a good way to get extra stats, is each mount you'll see comes with these insignia slots. And insignias are basically items that you can buy, very similar to enchantments, that you slot into mounts and they give you stats. They also, when you put all three in, give you a bonus. Um, and it will tell you what the bonus is when you slot them. I won't go through them because there's tons of videos covering these off, but some of the bonuses that give you hit points back are really useful to have when you level it. But again, in terms of mounts and insignias, I would not worry about it until you get to level 70 or 80. I would maybe try and get at least a rare mount, which is the blue color, because it's gonna make zipping around uh, the campaigns much quicker. But it is, again, optional. It's just you'll notice how slow a normal mount is, it can really, really, really slow the time down that you level and can just annoy you quite a lot. Um, so the last thing to look at before we move on to, to setting your character up is if you decide you want to buy currency, the first thing you should 100% buy is VIP. So this isn't on sale at the moment, but it is on sale fairly regularly. You can get 15 to 50% off of this. And then what this does is it gives you 30 days of a VIP status. Every time you buy VIP, your status goes up from 1 to 12. And you get varying different uh, perks for that. Uh, some of the ones that are really, really useful, as you've seen already, you can get a signpost. So you don't have to travel anywhere on your mount. You can just travel everywhere fast. You can summon a banking portal, which is your own personal bank to keep stuff that you can't fit in your bag. And you can also, which is really handy if you do a lot of selling stuff, is you can summon a mailbox uh, to pick up the items that you've either sold or bought. The main benefit of VIP, which I can show you now because I haven't collected mine yet. I'm not sure I want to do it on this character, but we'll do it anyway. Nope, I don't have any lot boxes. So basically you'll get a green rewards pack which every character on your account gets. And that will have five healing potions relevant to the level that you're at and a re-roll token. These are basically used for end game chests. If you don't like the rewards, you can re-roll them and they'll, give you a, they'll offer you a different set of rewards. And then the second item is a bag which has a key in it, which is called an enchanted key. And these are used as you go through, um, once you get to a certain level, lock boxes will start dropping. And these lot boxes can, can contain gear ranging from 5,000 AD worth of value up, up to 10 million. Um, so I don't have any in my bank either. But what will happen is you'll get a key every day, you'll open that lot box and it will give you items. I would recommend when you're early and leveling, sell every single thing that comes out of a lot box that's worth money. It's the best way to generate money. It's gone down a little bit with the new lot boxes and the way the game's changed. But I would think... Over a course of a month, your average key should be fifteen to 20,000 Astral Diamonds worth. So if you bought VIP for a month, you're going to get 
at least I would think half a million Astro Diamonds in items from selling them. You might get really, really lucky and get one of the bigger ticket items. You might be unlucky, get really, really, really poor stuff and only make a couple of hundred thousand. But in terms of VIP, 100% do it. Even if you end up saving Astro Diamonds up to buy the Zen, to buy the VIP, I would do it. So that's covered all of that, the area of companions, enchantments, mounts, uh, how to level. That should cover everything that you need to just basically blitz through the campaign, enjoy it, because some of the stories are really good, and then get to level 70. Now the max is 80, but quite a big shift happens at 70, and I'll go through that now. So this is the last part of the video, and it's I've gotten to level 70, what do I do? Because I've not got a clue. You're going to get loads and loads and loads of new quests pop up. Um, and it's very, very difficult to know what to do. So I, before the last mod dropped, level 70 was the cap. And it's now 80. I had a few old characters I haven't used since it dropped. So I can really give you a good overview of what to do when you get to 70. So this part of the video might be quite long, but this is definitely, definitely going to benefit you. If you've just started and you're level 5 or 6, probably not worth watching this now. Come back once you hit 70 and watch this part of the video. So what I will need to do quickly is just pick a spec for my character because I don't, I don't actually care what these are. Just so it doesn't keep popping up. Don't copy what I'm doing because I don't even know what I'm selecting. This is just so we can get to that last bit of the game. So what will happen is I'll have just hit 70 and it will pop up and then it will probably tell you to go to Protect Zonclave, you'll see Sergeant Knox, you'll see Lord Neverember and you will get loads and loads of quests for endgame campaigns and they will be all of these, you will have all of these pop up, you might not have access to all of them straight away and I'll explain what to do with those in a moment. So. First thing you need to do when you hit 70 is go to Protectors Enclave. This is where if you think there's a quest that should be available and you don't have it, it's very likely to either be Sergeant Knox or Lord Neverender. Neverender? The new one. Lord Neverember in Protectors Enclave. So I'm going to go to Sergeant Knox. The quest that I'm looking for is the quest to start the newest content, which is Undermountain, which is basically the content that goes up to level 80. You don't need to do the content to actually level to 80, uh, but from leveling a new character, this is the easiest way to do it if your character is able to complete the content. So it's going to be two steps to this. They're both really important and they're both going to help you massively. The first is what quest to get, what to do. And the second is then going to be kind of what your next steps are to make sure that your character is cap as capable as possible, really of completing these campaigns. So we're gonna go up to Sergeant Knox, who's around there somewhere. And then we're gonna go, and there will be a, like a rosette, like a document behind him. You pick that document up, and that is gonna start the undermounting campaign. And then this will tell you basically to go to the awning portal to start the quest. The reason I'm saying you wanna do this one is because you will get a whole set of gear that is going to be so much better than anything you've picked up so far. So there we go. An important invitation. This is a quest that you want. Meet with Nord Never Ember in the Moonstone Mask. Okay, I will. So, if you don't have VIP, you would need to travel down here and it will tell and you can then teleport across to important invitation. If you've got, I think it's either rank one or two VIP, you can actually just teleport direct to Moonstone Mask. So that's what we'll do now. Uh, once you arrive there, you basically go into a meeting room. There's a few cutscenes that tell you about the dangers of Undermountain and, and what, what not. If it's the first time, I always watch the cutscenes because there is some interesting stuff in them. And I don't really see the point of playing a game if you're going to skip through everything. Especially not on your first playthrough. So, we'll go into this meeting room. I'm going to skip through this because I don't want the video to be any longer than it needs to. But if it's your first time, I wouldn't. And then what he's going to do is give you a quest and before you leave the room you have to open a chest and basically get a whole new set of gear. 
It will be gear already filled with rank 8 enchantments. If it's your first character, you'll get a new weapon set. You basically get everything you need. You get some companion items as well. So we'll speak to Lord Neverember. He's going to talk about a vision, which I'm going to skip. Speak to him again. And then, as you'll see, that chest is lighting up. I'm just going to make sure, yeah, I have enough bag space to fill the stuff in. So, what we'll do first is look at my stats. So, the game, in terms of your stats, gives you an item level. As you can see, mine's 5,000 at the moment. This is gear that I picked up from doing the level 60 to 70 campaign. So, it's not the worst for the level that I was at. But they're certainly much better available. So, we're a 5,000 item level, and our stats are pretty pathetic. Like, 2,000 armor pen, we're going to struggle to kill anything. So, we're going to claim these rewards, and you can see all this stuff we've got here. You get some artifacts as well, you get a weapon, you get an offhand, and you get some companion gear as well. So, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to take that, and I am going to equip all this gear, which is what you want to do. I say I wouldn't worry about anything in terms of what the enchantments are or anything in it. Realistically, unless you spent real money, it's going to be way better than anything that you've already got. And they all come with rank 8 enchantments, which is awesome. Even if you don't want them, you can take them out and you can break them down for refinement points. So there we go, that's got my character up, and look at those stats that I've now got. I've literally gone up 24,000 in armor pen, I've just gone up all over the board, and now my character, he's still nowhere near ready to tackle that under mountain content, but he's getting there. And this is where we go on to step two. Now I'm going to spend a bit more AD than you need to on this, because just to show you what the end result would be. But this is 100% what I recommend you do now. In terms of gear, I think you need to spend around 35,000 AD to improve your stats even more and you should be set up that you can actually start tackling the undermounting uh, content if you want to. So, let's see if I've got the required money. So some bits I've already got, so I'm not going to buy it just for the sake of it. But let's take out 40,000 AD from my bank. This, you would, this is the money that you will get from doing that leveling queue every day. So on about the fifth day of doing that, you should have easily 50,000 AD with your bonuses, maybe 55, 60. That's going to be plenty to get a massive jump on your stats. So the first thing we're going to do is we want a, an epic companion. So I have one because I've bought a few packs in the game where you get companions that you can apply to every character. But the packs are pretty expensive. They range from like 4,000 to 10,000 zen. I'm an idiot. I buy that sort of stuff. But what you can do is there'll always be a companion that is really, really saturated on the market. They'll either drop from a lockbox or they might drop really regularly from a particular dungeon that people run. So as we speak right now, the companion's called an Energon. But what I would do is just go Epic, because at this stage, it doesn't matter what companion, we're not actually planning to keep this. But as it turns out, Energon has a great bonus. As you can see, on the player power bonus, it's 24,000 maximum hit points for 20,000 AD. That's just a nice to have. We just need the purple companion for the stats. So we're going to buy our Energon. Next thing you want to buy is three companion items with a bold preface. At this stage, we don't have any rune stones to slot in them, so we can just buy the rare ones. We don't need the epic purple ones because they don't give you any more stats. They just give you one more slot to put in a rune stone. But for the moment, we're not buying a rune stone. The other reason is that you're going to get uh, really good companion gear when you finish that undermounting campaign so I'm just going to double check quickly because you do get I believe some campaign gear from that chest defense deflection critical bonus come out bunch okay so actually that item no in fact you don't need to buy them because you'll get to the items here 
that's probably the only one I wouldn't run because defence and deflection, yeah, it helps keep you alive, but we want to just concentrate on damage. So I'm going to take my tags of the Undermountain and Silver Link and I'm going to put them in that companion that I've just bought. So we'll go to our mailbox, get our companion. You basically just have to give one a name when you want to equip him. So I want to bind him. I'll just call him Ernie for now. Why not? For some reason it doesn't let you, if you're on Xbox, actually confirm. You have to back out and then it will put him in there. And then the other thing you need to buy is three rank 9 bonding runestones. These drop for fun out of lock boxes. So it may be that you've actually already had some drop if you've got VIP. If you don't, rank 9s are so, so cheap for what they give. So you can get three for less than 10,000 AD. I've already got 10, so I'm not going to buy any more. But I will go and I will summon the companion that we've bought, which is the Energon. Now what you'll notice is, even though it's an epic and he can be a max rank of 35, he's rank 1. So the first thing you need to do, which you can do passively as you level up, is get that Energon leveled up to level 35. So as I said, because this is a almost ready steady cook, here's one I did earlier, I'm going to use some AD and some companion books to actually get him leveled up a bit quicker. It's up to you whether you do this, it is quite a good quality of life thing, but it is money that you don't have to spend and it could be spent elsewhere. So I've got my companion summoned, all I need to do to give him experience is start dropping these experience tones. And I think it's, oh, it's quite a lot. So it's 5 or 6 to get him all the way up to 35, so if you wanted to do it, it's 10,000 AD to get all that experience. But we then have to actually train him. So. We can see now he's rank 1, max 35, but he needs training to get to that 35. So companion options, begin training. Now you can see it's going to take 20 hours. So realistically, you could just say I'm going to train him when I finish playing and I'm not going to play again for 20 hours. When I come back, my companion is going to be level. That's what I would do. I don't want to wait 20 hours to then carry on making my video, so I'm going to rush that training. So as you'll see, he's now rank 35. You'll also notice all the bonding slots and all the companion gear has opened up for me. So I'm going to slot our bonding stones and I'm going to slot the gear that I wanted to. Right, so this will then give you quite a big boost to stats. So if we look at our actual companion, you can see now he's got loads of stats. 28, 33, 43, he's probably got 100, 110,000 worth of stats. Our bondings at 120% are going to give us 120% of those stats. So just to show you the difference this sort of 30 or 40k makes, I'm going to go and unsummon my companion. So I'm going to dismiss him. So now I don't have a companion summoned. I'm going to go and look at my stats, and they are not too. They're not too bad. 40k power, 25k armor, pen really low crit avoidance, really low accuracy, it's not looking good. And the under mountain area, you realistically need to make sure you're efficient as possible, 66,000 on each stat. You don't need that, you can certainly complete it with way less, it just makes it easier. So if we then go to our companion, and we say, yeah, I want to summon him back up actually, so I'm going to summon my Energon. We then go back and look at our stats and you'll see that as your companion gets summoned your stats will get a massive boost again. So we've now got 50,000 power, 42k thousand armor pen. We've no longer got a deflect and crit avoidance that are literally 10,000 or less. And this will keep going up as you level up your bondings and you level up your gear. And then you can use the mounts that we spoke about earlier if you wanted to buy some mountain insignias. Blue ones are dirt cheap. So if you or even actually to be fair, purple ones in certain stats are pretty cheap. No, let's stick with blue. So you said, right, I'm actually lacking on armor pen. You would need some aggression. And then you can pick up individual ones for a thousand and they give you 280 armor pen. I wouldn't necessarily do it because you're literally going to get rid of them. Um, these kind of insignias and stuff is a whole new ball game at endgame. What I would do is get through the campaign, get yourself in a the guild. There is so much 
content to explain in Neverwinter, I think it would take 24 hours to do a video explaining all of that. But these stats that we've got are not too bad. Defensively, we're going to struggle and we're probably going to take a bit of damage. But in terms of power, armor pen, it's not too bad. Accuracy is awful, but accuracy isn't like other MMOs. You don't miss in Neverwinter, but you will have attacks that only do half damage. So if, for example, once we take our 28k off of it, our enemies are going to deflect, I don't know, 20% of our attacks, and 20% of our attacks are only going to do half damage. It honestly doesn't matter for the undermounting stuff. And what you'll also get as you go through undermounting, you're going to get way more gear drop, especially weapons that are decent. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a break from commentary because really that's kind of, this is all you need to do to actually get tackled into the content. Um, the other thing I'm going to go through quickly is campaigns. So what you'll notice, ignore the ones with green, this is because I've completed it on other characters and there's certain things that I can take. Um, <clears throat> There's some campaigns are long, difficult, some are short and easy. Elemental Evil, there's no time gate in. You can just literally do the quest as you go along. Once you've got, I would wait until you've got all your gear and you will literally breeze through all of this. And then you get boons at the end of it. So every time you complete a leg of a campaign, you get what's called a boon. And they, they allow you to, to put stats into... Uh, certain areas so this is the first level so i can put a boon in here i can't because i don't have any but once i completed it and it will give me 250 power you can respect these as and when you like but you need a respect token but what i would do is literally go power and health all the way or look up a guide for the class that you're playing they'll tell you which boons to take the other thing which massively is beneficial, which you'll get from your guild, is you get boons there as well. So I've got a power boon that gives me 8,000 power. I've got a defense boon that gives me 8,000 defense. And then I've got an experience booster, which I will use until I hit 80. And then I'll change it to a mount speed one. Now, if we look at our stats, actually, is that eight power, 8k power give me a lot? No, because I'm really short on armor pen. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, right, I want to take armor penetration instead. It will depend. Different guilds have different boons, but most will have armor pen and power. So now my armor pen is 50k and it's getting much nearer to the 60 or 6,000 that we need. Now, as you can see, we're still short on a lot of stats, but you will get companion gear, much better items in terms of leveling gear as you get to 80. These stats will increase probably 10 and 20,000 again. So your last step after you've done this, as I've explained, is everything revolves around those bonding stones. So should you be upgrading your rank line bonding stones? That all depends on the market. So if we look at the next level, because we've got nines, so we, there's no point buying nines. So if we just look at rank 10 enchantments, bondings are the cheapest one and they cost 42,000. Right. What we then need to look at is, okay, so it's 42,000, but what do my bondings, if I want to upgrade the ones I've got, what am I going to spend? And actually, it's quite a lot. Two rank four marker potency, which if you're buying them individually off the auction house, are probably for the two going to cost you 36,000 astral diamonds minimum. Three enchanted stone rank four, they'll be dirt cheap next to nothing. I'm not even going to count the costs on them. And this is the biggie, 20% chance. So on average, you're going to need five wards to actually refine this item. And a ward is basically, give or take, it's, it's 10 zen, basically, for a ward. So you need 50 zen for wards, which if we go back here and say, right, 50 zen is 25,000 AD. So hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to spend 25,000 astral diamonds. Oh, sorry, that's selling it. It's not going to be much different, though. So say I wanted that 50 zen, it's 25,000 astral diamonds. Then on top of my 36,000, that's 61,000. Then I've got to put refinement points in it as well. Let's say they're worth a couple of thousand. It's going to cost me 65,000 to level up one rank line bonding. Okay, let's have a look. Ah, they're 42,000. So 100%, just buy the rank 10s, sell the 9s. Even if you make very little back on the 9s, you're still making profit. And it's, you've got to do that with every rank of bonding that you look at. 
And then I think 11, if I remember rightly, is about a 10% chance. And I think you need about 50 to 60K worth of refining stuff. So let's have a look at that. So we've got some different enchantments turned up here. So we'll go to the first lot of bondings. And they are 98K. Again, it's more expensive to upgrade your bondings than buy new ones. And you have to do this at every level. And this is what you should be spending your money on every time you get it, is get the next level bondings because they make an absolute ridiculous difference to your stats. Especially when you get to the end of your level 80 campaign, you're going to get um, companion gear that's got 10,000 stats on it. And then if you go from 120% to 200%, that's so many more stats that you pick up. So, just to tease you, I'm going to pick up my rank 15 bondings. Now, bear in mind, this character has nothing. He has zero boons. I've not got any gear other than this beginner gear. I haven't even got rune stones. I haven't got any companions assigned to my other slots. So let's put in these rank 15s. Now, these are, these are end game. They're expensive. They take a long time to get and level up. But then if we look at where we are now, we are pretty much at cap for armor penetration. We're pretty much at cap for critical strike. And when we get the accuracy gear from the end campaign, we will be capped on accuracy. So you can see the difference this makes. And actually, this is really, really minimized this difference on this character because he doesn't have anything on his companion. If I had gear that was 10,000 stats instead of six, and I had rune stones that had a thousand stats on, that's so many more stats. And also, my companion's not legendary, he's epic. If I upgraded to legendary, even more stats. If I then swap him from a fighter to an augment, even more stats. And that's what that's the progression you want to aim for. You want bondings to, I would say, at least rank 13. Get the companion gear you want with rune stones 10, 11, 12. That's at the point when you say, right, now I need to level my companion up, get him to legendary. It's expensive. It's a million AD, so make sure you get advice on what companion to use and how best to use it. So I know that part of the video took ages, and I'm really sorry. I just wanted to make sure that we went through everything that was needed. Um, so really, that's kind of where I'm going to leave you. I'll leave you to start leveling, get through the campaigns, come back to bits on this video. Don't just do it all in a wanna. Probably a bit late point at the end. Sorry, I will put something at the beginning, and then. Feel free to use the comments to ask me questions. I want more people to play Neverwinter and I want more people to enjoy it and I want more people to know what they're doing. It's so good when you can get in a group and they're like, oh yeah, I understand all that and I understand this and let's do this and you just get through content enjoyably and at a reasonable pace. What's really frustrating is not always through fault of players is you get very little guidance within Neverwinter and a lot of guides in terms of new players are very outdated it can be impossible to know what to do, especially if you get in with the wrong guild. Um, so please feel free to bombard the comments with questions and I will do my best to answer every single one. Um, but thank you, thank you very much for taking all the time to go through this video um, and I'll, I'll hopefully you'll enjoy some of the new content I'll release. Thanks.